Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Courtney Friedman. Let's get straight to the latest COVID-19 numbers in Bear County. There are 890 total confirmed cases. That's an increase of 75 since yesterday. Deaths have increased by four, bringing the total to 37. 77 people are hospitalized, 50 of them in the ICU, 36 on ventilators. During Mayor Ron Nuremberg's daily briefing today, he reported 72% of ventilators are available, along with 44% of hospital beds. 41 cases are still under investigation, but there's some good news. 147 people have now recovered in Bear County. Out of the 37 deaths, 17 come from the Southeast Nursing and Rehab Center where there is a COVID-19 outbreak. More than 100 residents and staffers have been infected with COVID-19. The facility has a history of poor health and safety ratings. County Judge Nelson Wolf confirmed today that two more inmates at the Bear County Jail have tested positive for COVID-19. This brings the total to 10. Nine of the inmates are at the infirmary at the Bear County Jail and the other is at University Hospital. We're also learning today a Bear County Sheriff's Office dispatcher who tested positive last week taught a, cl a class of cadets at the agency's training academy late last month. More than half of that cadet class has now tested positive. Flattening the curve of COVID-19 cases is on everyone's mind, both nationally and locally. Today, the city's website launched a new section showcasing various models, which with each showing the city's peak. Here's a breakdown of those projections. City officials added four different COVID-19 projection models to their website, two from UTSA, one from Oliver Wyman, and one from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is only making projections for the state of Texas. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg reminded everyone these models are not set in stone. And obviously these are dynamic models, so they will change from day to day, and they have literally changed overnight because of new modeling data that's been input into those. UTSA's Model 1 is a predictive math model. Under the city's current restrictions, the peak is expected in the third week of April, ending with a total 3,600 cases around late July. UTSA's Model 2 uses artificial intelligence and added scenarios like 10-day quarantine and social distancing. It shows the peak for mid-May with more than 29,000 cases in late August. The Oliver Wyman model shows the peak as late April with 1,700 cases through May and the IHME model projects Texas will hit its peak April 29th. Metro Health Director Dr. Don Emmerich says they're watching all the models closely as a guide to when San Antonio will actually hit its peak. It's just like the hurricane. So when we see a hurricane model go this way and another one go this way, somewhere in between is the truth. And so every day that we get more data in, that's gonna narrow and narrow and we're gonna have a little bit more of an idea of when that peak is. These models are available on the city's COVID-19 page and will be updated at 7 p.m. each day along with the case numbers. Dr. Emmerich also says Austin is doing similar peak modeling. Also during today's mayor's daily briefing, he spoke about the importance of all Bear County residents filling out the 2020 census. Mayor Nuremberg says a little over 50% of Bear County residents have filed. There are some aspects of life that continue to go on and need to. One of them is the census. Uh, we need to make sure that you fill out the census because it impacts your federal representation. It impacts the uh, funding that is available to us in the event of an emergency or basic infrastructure and essential services. Numbers in the state of Texas now, there are more than 16,000 cases and deaths are close to 400. The county is the county in Texas with the most cases is Harris County, which includes Houston with nearly 4,000 cases. We'll have an update on COVID-19 cases throughout the nation later in the newscast. One disease is enough. We're working tirelessly to protect our families against COVID-19, but in doing so, doctors say we may be allowing one opportunity for an outbreak of other diseases. A university health system doctor told me if kids don't go to their wellness visits to get vaccines, it could be detrimental to our communities. Sarah Dickinson and her husband have two daughters ages two and four months. Dickinson admits it's a scary time to have young children. Riley was born 10 weeks early, so obviously anything um, like this can be really dangerous for her. But even then, she took baby Riley to get her vaccinations yesterday. Vaccines are essential to prevent, you know, diseases such as mumps, uh, you know, varicella, uh, measles, as well as whooping cough. So I mean, we do still have outbreaks of measles and whooping coughs. Dr. Ileana Silva is a University Health System Pediatric Director. 
and wants parents to know vaccination well visits are categorized as essential for that reason. To make the appointment safe during the COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC and American Association of Pediatrics have made recommendations. To either you know schedule well child visits in the morning and then see sick visits in the afternoon so that way the populations don't mix or to have one side of the clinic dedicated to well visit with its own in entrance and exit. Parents are driving up so they can get screened for symptoms and get checked in all in their car instead of a waiting room. And when their appointment comes up, they get a call and walk in through a specific entrance. It was very limited interaction with people. And Dickinson wants to other parents to know her appointment was safe and necessary. I take um, it very seriously. I not only for my children to protect them, but to protect the other children in the community um, and other vulnerable people. Pediat pediatricians are prioritizing visits that need vaccines and for the other regular checkups, parents can use telemedicine, but Dr. Silva acknowledges some health insurance policies right now do not cover telemedicine for well child visits. If that's the case, just call your doctor to see if it's necessary for your child to come in or that they can postpone the visit until later. School closures may be a crisis on its own for disadvantaged families, but at Southside ISD, more than 85% of their students are economically disadvantaged. That's according to the Texas Education Agency. The district has been helping students as much as they can. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how it's impacting those families. I know that there was times where I go to school and that um, there was times where that was really not all I had to eat, but it was times where that was like the struggle meal. It hasn't always been easy for the Martinez family. I've been to pantries or things and felt kind of embarrassed at this place. You don't. Cheryl Martinez says her kids that go to Southside ISD schools have been getting free breakfast and lunch. I think that it's really amazing that our community is opening up and helping each other out in a situation like this. The district says since spring break to April 10th, they have served more more than 40,000 meals. Southside ISD student Destiny Martinez is thankful for the resources given to her. They sent the Chromebooks and then they said that here soon that they were going to give us hotspots, which I thought was crazy. Since students were released for spring break in early March, they haven't returned back to school because of the coronavirus pandemic. The principal at Southside High School says their curriculum has not changed. We have um, what's called a year at a glance and, and really it outlines what we're gonna be doing uh, each week of the semester, and so we have tried to still stay aligned with our year at a glance. Southside ISD has 6,000 students. The district has issued out more than 700 Chromebooks. Principal Demetria Sand says schools in the district are using Chromebooks to access instruction online, as well as their teachers who are facilitating their learning and providing support. The district spokesperson says today they received 500 Wi-Fi hotspots, and in just 12 hours, they had already received 150 requests from families. I can see definitely in the future the need to integrate the instructional technology into our traditional classroom um, and, and making that available, making that a mainstay because it, it is going to enhance instruction. Cheryl Martinez says they are thankful their children are not left behind during the coronavirus pandemic. I didn't know that there would be so much people working together to help the community and the kids. For the nine, Tiffany Huertas. The district says beginning Monday, it will also be serving students dinner. The district will remain closed though through May 4th. Know your rights. State laws are protecting renters from eviction until the end of the month and federal laws protect those in public housing until the end of July. Patty Santos tells us, the, tells us though, that doesn't mean you have the right to skip out on rent. People are being threatened with eviction when they've lost their jobs and they really have no hope of paying rent right now. Professor of Law Genevieve Fajardo says a notice to vacate is not the same thing as an eviction. If you are a tenant in San Antonio or anywhere in Texas, you cannot be removed from your house without a court order. In Bear County, eviction courts are closed until April 30th, and those who rent from landlords with federally backed mortgages are protected until July 25th. That is generally all public housing, Section 8 housing. That is any housing where there is a mortgage held by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, any type of um, federally backed mortgage. Keep in mind, there's no rent break. Your rent will be due once the protection is over or you will be evicted, but a help plan is in the works. 
we know people are, are, are scared, they're frustrated, uh, but we're, we're going to do everything we can to help people stay in their homes. San Antonio Councilman Roberto Trevino says nearly half of the city rents. The city is funneling money to renters assistance programs and a renters commission is being considered to protect families beyond the stay home, stay safe order. But with more than 4,100 calls to the city weekly for help through the risk mitigation fund, there's no guarantee. For the nine, Patty Santos. Renters who have questions about resources can call St. Mary's Law Clinic at 210-431-5716. And we have more information on ksat.com. Let's turn now to the nine at nine. The World Health Organization reacting to several overseas countries reopening their, econo their economy despite the ongoing pandemic. Some marine life is still feeling the effects of a massive oil spill 10 years later and the lasting impact of cheap gas in the U.S. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. The number of novel coronavirus cases worldwide now tops 2 million. Yet parts of Europe are easing some restrictions and allowing certain businesses to reopen. In Spain, which has the second most COVID-19 cases, nearly 300,000 workers are back on the job. And in Austria and Italy, which has more than 2,000 COVID-19 deaths, some bookshops and children's clothing stores are back in business. The World Health Organization is reacting to the reopenings. It cannot happen all at once. Control measures can only be lifted if the right public health measures are in place. There are only minor injuries following a nearly 50 vehicle pileup on a Chicago Expressway. Fire officials say 14 people were transported to the hospital and 45 others were evaluated at the scene. One driver described his experience. I just came over the, the uh, bridge there and there was just a pileup and nothing to do, nothing you could do. Uh, it was icy, it was snowing and uh, it was just a sudden stop. Weather could have been a factor as falling snow created slippery conditions on the roadway. A new study has revealed disturbing observations about the long-term impact of the 2010 BP oil spill disaster. 11 workers died and 168 million gallons of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. 10 years after the spill, scientists say they're still finding oil in fish populations. Some of the oil compounds found in the fish can be passed on to future generations through their eggs. Abbott Laboratories announced the release of an antibody test. It could detect if people have been infected with the coronavirus and have recovered. Abbott's test is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but the company is legally allowed to distribute it under regulatory flexibilities issued by the agency. The company is shipping a million of the tests to customers immediately. You want a COVID-19 test? You'll get one if you live or work on Florida's exclusive and wealthy Fisher Island. It's a luxury not afforded to the majority of Florida residents. The island known as one of the wealthiest zip codes in the U.S. is paying for testing for all residents and staff. The tests were purchased from the University of Miami Health System, but the cost was not revealed. The Tour de France is now postponed to August and September due to the pandemic. That means the race will not take place in its traditional June-July slot for the first time since the end of the Second World War. France's president has banned all large-scale public events until mid-July. One dollar per gallon gasoline could soon be coming to a station near you as the U.S. faces unprecedented decline in oil production. With most of the U.S. on shutdown, oil consumption and prices have dropped dramatically. The International Energy Agency says low prices and large inventories will greatly reduce U.S. crude production this year. Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren officially endorsed Joe Biden for president today. Warren tweeted out her endorsement with a video message. She follows Senator Bernie Sanders as the latest of Biden's top former rivals to throw their support behind the former vice president. And watch this, a Florida kindergarten Zoom class gets rocked by an unexpected guest, John Bon Jovi. The teacher recently tasked his students to write about their lives in quarantine. It's similar to a collaborative songwriting challenge Bon Jovi put on social media. The teacher reached out to Bon Jovi, who dropped in on the students' Zoom class. Using the kids' own words, he performed a mini concert for the students and their parents. Trapped in the house, now I feel like a mouse. My parents try their best, but I can tell that they're stressed. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Hey there, good evening. Man, another...
stellar day outside today. And I wish I could say it's just going to continue like this forever, but as we all know, that is not the case. We will pull off another pretty pleasant day tomorrow before things turn cooler and cloudy by Friday at the hands of a cold front. And that's going to keep us pretty chilly through at least Saturday. We'll start to warm up a little bit more to finish out the weekend on Sunday, but that front will really shake things up for us as we head into the upcoming weekend. So tonight, mostly clear skies, some high thin clouds out there, and temperatures will be allowed to fall back into the upper 40s here in San Antonio. So it'll be another cool night and a cool start to the day tomorrow. If you'll be out early, you may need a light jacket. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll see high temperatures make it into the 70s, so it will be warmer tomorrow than it was today. And you'll also notice increasing cloud cover during the day tomorrow, especially during the back half of the day. Then that takes us into Friday and not a huge change in our afternoon temperatures from Thursday to Friday, but what you've got to know about Friday is that 72 degrees, that's going to be right around midday before a cold front arrives to send our temperatures way down by late Friday afternoon. The warmest will get Saturday behind that front is the low 60s and then things will start to warm back up pretty quickly for the back half of the weekend and then into early next week. As far as any rain chances with this front, they're going to be pretty low as the frontal boundary itself comes through on Friday, a 20% chance of a shower. On Saturday, things will stay cloudy. A few more isolated showers will be possible. And then Sunday, we'll have a chance of some scattered showers in non-severe thunderstorms early on in the day before things dry out again as we head into early next week. So don't forget that Friday, 72 degrees, that's going to be there to, till about midday. And then we'll see temperatures fall down into the 50s, eventually bottoming out near 50 degrees early Saturday morning. And then a really cool day on Saturday with some light rain around. Early chance of a thunder shower on Sunday, and then we'll warm up 85 by Sunday afternoon. And next week looks pretty warm with chances of showers returning by the middle of next week. Thanks, Katie. We'll be back in one minute. Stay with us. As part of our San Antonio questions earlier today, our Steve Spreester hosted a virtual town hall focused on local innovative solutions to help fight the COVID-19 pandemic. The guests were local bioscience experts and San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Here are some of the highlights from that virtual town hall. What is slash are the biggest obstacles right now, industry and medical, to finding potential treatments and a vaccine for COVID-19? I think on the positive side, uh, it's incredible how many people are leaning in on therapies and vaccines. And I don't know, we may be up to 100 uh, therapies and vaccines. And if you listen to the uh, national news, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of coming to the market tomorrow. Um, I think the obstacles really get down to safety and efficacy. Um, we really do need the clinical trials. Um, these trials allow for us to directly compare the effect of any new therapy or vaccine relative to a so-called control group um, in a variety of individuals to really demonstrate that a given therapy is specific, safe, and works well uh, for COVID-19. That's critical in clinical trial studies, and it takes time and money to organize those trials. You need a certain number of people. Uh, it's they get expensive. So you've heard about phase one trials, which are small, they're safety trials, but the other trials are larger. Um, with regard to vaccine, I mentioned it in my opening comments. I think we really just need to know whether the vaccine is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, inducing the right kind of antibodies to protect against the virus. So you have to prove that. Uh, and you have to make sure that the vaccine itself is safe by not necessarily overstimulating the immune system. And again, that requires clinical trials. It requires um, basic science. It requires uh, animal studies. Um, and this just takes time. Um, I think we can cut some corners and the FDA has made some concessions, but we need to know that anything that goes to market is high quality, specifically, as Dr. Bedard was talking about, those antibody tests to make sure that 
there's not too many of what we call false positive or false negatives that mean that the test isn't really doing what it's supposed to be doing because we're going to rely on that test not only for therapeutic trials but also to begin to think about immunity in the population which is a different topic will the people who did not contract COVID-19 be the so-called second wave that we're hearing about of infections and do you think as a medical community and a biotech community that we're ready for a second wave or will be ready for a second wave? Well, I think, Steve, that we really can be. Uh, there could well be a second wave. We've done a great job, I think, uh, following the mayor and judges initiatives and advice on directives on social distancing, stay at home. Uh, we've done a great job uh, closing parks if we needed to. Uh, and I think that those sort of things have really helped us flatten the curve, which we've heard over and over uh, in the last few weeks. But it appears, at least of right now, that our surge is flattened. But that does mean that we're always at risk for increased infections down the road. So we've gonna, gonna, we're going to have to maintain our vigilance in this area. And that's something we'll really have to continue to address as a community in how we keep doing that over time, but also try to return to some normal normalcy in our lives. Mr. Mayor, while we have you here, I feel like I need to ask you about the uh, stay home work safe order right now. Uh, you have it through April 30th. Are you looking at extending that order? Yeah, we are, and uh, we want to do so thoughtfully. Uh, but I think if uh, the question on everyone's mind is uh, on May 1st, is our world substantially different than it is today? And there's no data to suggest that it will be. Uh, our, main, uh, and our main tool to fight the spread of this virus right now is the social distancing practices in place. So we're in the process right now, the judge and I, of uh, putting together uh, a, a medical panel uh, to ensure that we have the right data and inputs and understanding of our environment and what conditions need to be placed, be, be in place before we were to, to ease up on social distancing because it is working. Uh, we see around the world where social distancing has been practiced, uh, the, the curve does flatten, um, that we start to see the, the cases of infection wane off but we don't want to find ourselves back in the same situation again three or six months from now. Uh, we've got to be very thoughtful and we've got to be led by the science. I'm extremely hopeful that in this entire process, and unfortunately has cost lives to do this, but that we've once again uh, put policy and politics behind science and facts. Uh, finally, uh, we're starting to be driven by the public health and the medical authorities in this community when it comes to making medical and public po public health policy. To watch the whole virtual town hall, just head to our website ksat.com and click the SAQ link under the features tab. You can also watch any of our past SAQ interviews where we talk to local doctors, health experts and Mayor Ron Nuremberg weekly. We'll be right back. Turn to the day's top stories. Both SAPD and BCSO are reporting a significant decrease in DWI arrest since March 18th. That's the day an emergency order closed bars and restaurant dining rooms. For SAPD, between March 18th and April 13th, a total of 147 DWI arrests were made. Compare that to 318 DWI arrests almost a month before the mayor's order. And BCSO made 40 fewer DWI arrests for that same period. The lower numbers don't necessarily mean people are drinking less, it could just be that people are following that emergency order. San Antonio colleges and universities are receiving millions of dollars in aid after Congress passed the CARES Act. The federal grants awarded to San Antonio schools amounted to $62 million. At least half of it's going towards providing students with emergency financial aid. In total, 10 schools were given funding, including UTSA, San Antonio College, St. Mary's University, and more. We have that full list on our website. 
Toyota employees in San Antonio are producing and distributing about 75,000 face shields to first responders and medical personnel. The shields will be given to Bear County and the state of Texas to distribute. The plant has been making face shields since the beginning of the month after it temporarily stopped producing vehicles. The plant will continue to produce until the end of the month. Vehicle production is slated to resume on May 4th. New COVID-19 hotspots are emerging across America with now more than 600,000 Americans testing positive for COVID-19. The hope is that people who recover from the virus and develop antibodies will develop immunity. That's as the FDA quickly approved a new saliva-based COVID-19 test. This New Jersey facility rolling them out, the results expected within minutes. And now a new potential hotspot in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. More than 400 workers at a single pork processing plant are now sick with at least 100 of them testing positive already. The governor has resisted stay at home orders and the mayor is asking him to take action. We're growing increasingly concerned about um, the need to mitigate that spike before um, it overwhelms our hospitals. Health agencies have been aggressively pursuing a vaccine and even human clinical trials, but a vaccine that's publicly available is not expected for another 12 to 18 months. Today, President Donald Trump saying he's working with states on a strategy to reopen. More than 20 could possibly lift closures. The governors on both coasts, including states like California and New York, have already taken action and are working together with other states in their regions to collectively decide when to reopen their economies. The president is also taking action against the World Health Organization, cutting off its funding while conducting a review of its management. What's up, guys? It's time to check out some stories that are trending tonight on KSAT.com. And let's start with a pretty interesting story of a San Antonio resident who put together a website that checks curbside delivery for HEB stores in the San Antonio area. So this gentleman, his name is Brandon. That's the only information he wanted to give us. Uh, Brandon, he created this website and posted it on Reddit. So it's uh, gone a little bit viral. It's been shared a few times. And basically, he just told us that He's been a programmer for years and he works on uh, several websites. He didn't mention which ones, but he wanted to put this together because he had noticed some frustrations people have had with curbside delivery. And um, if you go to his website, all you have to do is put in your zip code and it should give you the available curbside options for your area. So pretty interesting story of, uh, again, someone who just took to Reddit and decided to share some information with us. So if you want more information on this tool, head to uh, KSAT.com. All right, moving on here, uh, the Magic Theater. They, of course, are one of the many theaters that have struggled uh, throughout this, uh, but they are doing something pretty cool. They are putting together virtual activities for kids. So they're doing this um, while kids are away from school, of course, and they're including all sorts of different things. Uh, there's a reading hour, there's Mad Libs in there. Uh, they have a Pirate Pete and Friends is another thing they're doing. And they also have children's yoga. How about that? Children's yoga, that's pretty cool. So this is all gonna be streamed live on their Facebook page. This is the Magic Theater. And again, they're just kind of doing some different things. And they've also come up with something called the E Academy. E Academy actually. And it starts um, May 1st, and that's for kids that are ages 6 to 12. So make sure you check out more information, another way to kind of keep the kids busy uh, during this whole um, quarantine time. All right, last story of the day. You know, Andrea Bocelli played the other day, Easter Sunday, at the Duomo Cathedral in Milan. But I'll tell you what, he can't hold a candle to Flaco Jimenez and Raulito because they're putting together a series of virtual concerts that are gonna tear us, that are gonna start next week. Yes, Flaco and Raulito, they're gonna be coming into your house to play music for you. Uh, this is actually pretty cool. They have uh, three separate concerts that they're putting together, virtual concerts. It's gonna be April 22nd, the 29th, and May 6th. It also includes a concert from one of the Commodores. It's pretty neat. So if you want more information, head over to a website, ksat.com. Hope you guys have a great night and stay safe and stay healthy. And I will check in with you guys again later. Bye.
Well, we know the news can be hard to hear at times, so we always want to end your show by telling you something good. This is a segment we normally do on the weekend evenings, but now we're bringing it to the news at nine. This photo was sent to us by Louise Martinez. She says when her friend Letty George heard the San Antonio battered women and children shelter needed essential supplies, she immediately stepped up to help. Right there, Letty made three trips to the donation center with a car full of much needed items like diapers, wipes and formula. Thank you, Letty, so much for what you do for the community. Remember, you too can send us something good, a picture, video, description of an act of kindness, a quote, anything that can bring a little light to our community during these tough, dark times. Email us at somethinggood@ksat.com, and you just may see it at the end of the News at 9 or our weekend Night Beat shows. And thank you so much for joining us for the News at 9. Don't forget the Night Beat starts at 10. Have a good night.